and gentlemen, everyone, welcome to you. You're watching another episode of Encounter. Today, we have Swami Kadamba Kanana, who is a senior member of ISKCON for over 40 years. He's originally from the Netherlands and now lives in India. Swami, everyone, welcome to you. Thank you so much. Um, I mentioned uh, now you live in India, but you live in India for more than 40 years. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's uh, almost 50 years ago that I went to India for the first time and I had wonderful experiences in India. People were uh, very welcoming. Well, um, f almost 50 years sounds a figure, but if I say half a century ago, mm. this is where you really feel how, how long ago it was. It's my life. I mean, the main part of my life. Of course, I'm 65, but you know, it's the main part of my life. So what was the reason why you went to India? Um, when I was younger, um, I grew up in post-war Netherlands, which is a country, uh, a lot of trade, big ports. It was very destroyed in the war. My parents were the generation that was building, rebuilding the nation. And it was a little, the focus was just on material things. So as a reaction, we started looking for more spirituality. And then naturally you came to India because India is the one country in the world which has still a tremendous focus on spirituality. In Europe you got to go back to the Middle Ages to see that kind of focus. But in India, even today, it's still very, very strong. Did you already discover ISKCON, which is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, in India or did you, did you um, hear about it before in the Netherlands? I did hear about it before in the Netherlands. But initially, I could not just place it, you know. It, uh, it seemed so extravagant. And suddenly, one day, this van pulled into my town. The, the back door flipped open, and all these pink men came out. Too many, you know. So I said, like, how can so many come from one vehicle? I was suspicious. It seemed very awkward. So it took time to sort of take it in. And it was via India that the culture became more, uh, more realistic. You have a drive to serve people. Mm. Was it already within you before you traveled to India and you were already seeking for something higher? Ah, definitely. I think something like that is not just emerging at one point. It is something deeper in one's nature, maybe from a Bhagavad Gita perspective, one would say maybe from last life, already something there. So there was a lot of inquisitive and deeper meaning in life. And I had from a young age a drive to, uh, to present a message to the world. So I became a songwriter at a young age, because I have this musical talent, so I started to write songs and songs about, and that, that was a hobby, but it was, it, it meant a lot to me. Yeah. And I had a message, uh, uh, like one of the, in one of the songs, I, I, I wrote a refrain which said, uh, I'm nothing but a stranger, always around, I'm nothing but a seeker, for what I've never found. So that answers your question. I was a seeker, and I wasn't quite sure where it was, but I was a seeker, yes. In a way, it's uh, how you surrender yourself also. Yes, and, and that is, of course, uh, a process. It is a step-by-step -step process. It's not like a one-time act, you know, now very dramatic, and now I'll surrender. Because even when we try that, then we realize that maybe we didn't fully surrender. There, there's a whole transition phase that you have to go through. It's not like a button you just press. That's right. Exactly. That's right. And it's, it's uh, in one sense, it's a lifetime mission. I'm still, uh, still trying to increase my surrender today. I'm trying to go deeper. I'm trying to, to learn. So it's never like, oh, there is nothing more to learn. Uh, there's always more to learn. The drive to keep learning is still there and you keep on, you would say, improving yourself every day? Yeah, you know, like when you take to spiritual life, you, you always have something to look forward to. You know, they say a young person looks forward and the older person, an elderly person, looks backward. Right? And 
has not much to look forward to. I mean, cannot do so many things anymore. But one who's on the spiritual path always has something to look forward to. Even after this life, there's something to look forward to. Therefore, one doesn't develop that mood from it's over now. No, there's always a challenge, always so much to do. So we stay alive. So mentally we stay young. There is always something to look for and mm. hopefully it's exciting. It is definitely exciting, no <laughs> doubt about it. No doubt about you, it. You mentioned earlier that um, you were a songwriter. You come from a family, from a family background of musicians, which uh, probably explains a lot. Yes, but of course that was more the hobby, otherwise it's a business family. Just managers, either family businesses or executive posts in some of the big companies. So like that, management, management, management was the other side of the, of the coin. And I have both in me. The reason why I'm asking uh, if you come from a musical background mm -hmm. is you're known nowadays for carrying out kirtans, you mm -hmm. sing. Mm -hmm. Uh, people look forward to attending the yes. kirtans yes. that uh, you carry out. Yes. Uh, what is your drive for it? Why, why is it important for people to attend kirtans? Okay, well, you know, the very essence of kirtan, the Sanskrit word kirtan, kirti means to glorify. So it's to glorify. Kirtanam is the word. So to glorify the Supreme Lord, that is the idea. The kirti, the glories of the Lord, then are being meditated upon through hearing and through chanting at the same time. So it's very interesting because on the one hand, while we are chanting, we're making an offering to the Lord. And at the same time, by this name that manifests, we're getting the darshan of the Lord. We're getting the... The, the presence of yeah. the Lord, the blessings. Uh, darshan comes from dristi, to see. We see the Lord, the Lord sees us, which is more important. And His seeing is blessing us, is, is touching us, is uplifting us. So these things are happening. From a logical point of view, mm. the fact that you sing and you have music around you, mm. does it not change the vibration of your body? Uh, Does it not increase in terms of why I'm asking you is that because once you increase your vibration, you're able to connect to mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. you're glor glorifying mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. hence you're able to tune in to connect better. So, you know, we, in terms of bodies, we're looking at the soul situated in a subtle body made of mind, intelligence and false ego, according to the Bhagavad Gita, and then a gross body. Uh, made of Bhumirapo Nalo Vayu, uh, earth, water, fire, air, eater, and so on. Now, so whatever influence there is on the gross body, there is some, definitely some influence of the transcendental sound, then it penetrates deep, deeply into the subtle body. Uh, and there it purifies the entire existence. So this vibration that enters, it is said, According to Indriyano Mano Budir Asya it says within the, in the senses, within the mind, and with the intelligence, we have become distracted. Avritam Gyanami Te Na, we have become covered. Kamarupa in Akuntea, by this Kamarupa, by the desire to control and enjoy the material energy. So, when we put these transcendental vibrations <clears throat> in our uh, consciousness, yes, then it alters the consciousness. It alters. And it reorients, it creates a reorientation towards the spiritual uh, and draws us back from all these material things in which we've invested a bit of our consciousness. Example, you have money. Ah, okay, you lock it away. The key is in your pocket. Not only have you locked away your money, you've locked away a piece of your mind as well with that money. That right? makes sense, yes. Yeah. You'll yeah. always be worried what's happening to the a money. A little bit, right? Yeah. You feel good about it. It's locked. It's good. It will always be behind your it's, mind. It's in the mind. Yeah. It's in the mind. Your car, you know, you parked your car there. Is you it know still it's there? It's there. It's in a safe place, <laughs> right? You know, you know it's there. So like this, we have so many things 
And there's all like, some of our energy is in all these things. The mantra takes us back from all these things and just lifts us up to the pure spiritual platform. But we just let go. And once you come to that place of just letting go, that's where, where surrender really comes in. So in, um, in simpler terms, if I may yes, say please. so, it's not about not listening to all the noise in the head. Mm. It's more about shifting your focus on what is more important. Correct. Because the noise will always be there. Yes. The idea, the, the, the simple example is, you know, there is some, there's a glass of water with some ink in it. How to get it out? Just add water. Just keep on adding water. And eventually it will become clear. Right? So that's the idea. All this background noise, yes, it's there. Uh, so many things in our consciousness. There are meditation techniques where one tries to empty the consciousness. But when it comes to the chanting of the Maha Mantra and in Kirtan, it works in a different way. It's like the water that is just poured in and all the ink of unnecessary thoughts and desires will disappear. Would it be true to say that there is, there used to be a lot of people attending Kirtans before? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't there be more people attending Kirtans now? Absolutely, of course. I mean, Kirtan, and other spiritual practices are essential elements of, of society. Exactly. This is what I, I want to ask you because we seem to be shifting away towards the materialistic and technological aspect of the world. Mm -hmm. But we should not also forget that kirtans are very important for the body yes. and soul. Yes. See, and that's uh, the nice thing about kirtan is that it's, uh, it's not limited to a traditional setting. Say we do temple worship and temple rituals, etc. That requires a, a lot of traditional arrangement, which in the modern world are not always easy. Excellent. Like, for example, in a temple, there should not be a bathroom, it should be outside. Right? Well, it's complex in the modern world, you know, like no uh, bathroom outside the building, right? not so easy. So, so many examples of how to try traditional things are difficult. But Kirtan, can be done in any place, in any time, in any situation. Uh, even in the car, even while driving, one can play some kirtan, hear the kirtan, sing along. So kirtan is something very easy to apply in the modern lifestyle. You just mentioned any time, any place, and I, can't, I have a picture in my mind where you see uh, people with the mridang and uh, Walking and dancing on the on the streets yes. in London, in London, or anywhere in the world, mm. and just singing their hearts out and happy to be doing what they are doing. Yeah. Yes, yes, and people are looking astounded. Right, some, some are sharing a bit in that happiness. Some are feeling that yes, there is happiness there. It is, uh, and they share it, and as a result. It's like they become touched, and they look, they smile, they stand there, and, and some attraction awakens. And they'll meet the kirtan again. You know, next time it comes around, those people that were previously attracted will become more attracted. Maybe one day they'll be part of it. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Even if people have not gone to a temple or have never seen a procession on the streets, mm -hmm. but it will attract, it will get your attention if you see a procession on the streets, because then what people don't realize is that they're walking their daily routine, but at that very moment, it shifted their focus from the daily stress to something else. It might look funny to them, yes. but it did make them laugh and smile it did f create some positive energy within them. Yes, yes. So, and, yes. and I think a lot of people don't realize this, this part of it. Yes. They, they always, is it true to say that people tend to think what they don't have instead of what they have at the present moment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a mm -hmm. major issue nowadays? It is, it is. I mean, because nowadays um, we are not taught to be satisfied with external, with relatively simple, appropriate arrangements, and to look more inside for deeper meaning in life. Uh, we stop looking inside for meaning in life, and we look too much for the meaning in life in the things around us. In terms of validation from others? 
validation from others in terms of the objects that we possess and what they bring us and all these things. Whereas previously we see a somewhat more natural culture then somewhat more simple, more connected to the roots of our being and more internal life, which then was connected to, to God or a deeper spiritual goal in life. You have a big drive to share uh, spirituality. Is that, is that what is your goal in life? That is my goal in life and spiritual knowledge. So besides Kirtan, I also speak on scriptures such as Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavad Purana, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and explain these texts. I spend a lot of time uh, in my life studying these texts, so I have, I have tried to live according to the texts. So I speak uh, explaining the text and then giving uh, insights in, from, from realization. Realization means living with the text. And in that way, the text comes alive. In that way, people find a clear message of what to do with their life, how to live a life where uh, we become elevated. You know, once I was in charge of admitting new people to our ashram, and one person came, and he was a mathematician. And I asked him, I said, why have you... Why do you want to stay in this ashram? He said, well, I have calculated that the goal of life must be self-improvement. Don't ask me how he calculated it. He was a mathematician. He's got a very logical mind. He had, a, he had calculated it. You know, I don't know how he did it. But the conclusion was pretty good. Good calculation. Yeah. You know? I mean, he was right. The goal of life is begins with self-improvement and from there the world can improve. Otherwise, if we all speak about lofty goals but we're not working to improve ourselves, then they are just like uh, good New Year's wishes that will last for a day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a couple of hours. A couple of hours, whatever. What has been the major change for you, not since you joined ISKCON, but in terms of living the scriptures? Uh, please share a few stories. The main thing is seeing, seeing Krishna in, through thick and thin, because thick and thin will come in our life. Uh, there will be wonderful inspirational moments, and there will be very big taxing moments. I've in my life uh, experienced wonderful moments of... Uh, of, of great fulfillment in the relationship with Krishna or wonderful moments in, read, in relishing the conclusions of the scriptures. And I've experienced very trying, difficult uh, moments. One time, suddenly, out of nowhere, a bullet, bang, in my back. Bullet from back to front, ripping through me. Somehow, I survived. At that time, uh, I could rise above this external thing because I had this connection with Krishna and I could see beyond. I could abandon all feelings of anger towards whoever did this. I could just leave it and I could just remain satisfied and say, well, the Lord has a plan for me. Um, so, through thick and thin, Krishna was there always and is there always. And that gives us that, that shelter. Sometimes very sweet, sometimes difficult. So it's not that my life is only sweet. That, oh, not at all. I just gave you one dramatic example. <laughs> that was very dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. But, but, it's, but the wonderful thing is, because of the connection with Krishna, I'm not traumatized by that. Some people would have such an experience, would be traumatized for life. But I could move on. I could let it go emotionally. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions on uh, a few symbolisms uh, in ISKCON? Like, I want to know, 
uh, why are you wear the necklace, why the tikka, mm -hmm. why you have, can, can, do you mind if I ask you? Please, please, please. So, um, why do you have the tikka on, on the forehead and especially okay. that sign, yeah. Okay, so there's tilak, there yeah. are different types of tilak and according to the tilak you can see what someone's spiritual orientation is. So, this is Vaishnav tilak. It is sacred clay, Gopi Chandan, from a place in Gujarat. It is this clay mark is actually installed on the forehead. So as in the morning, I prepare the tilak in my hand and with some water and place it on the forehead, I'll chant Om Kesavaya Namaha. And by chanting Om Kesavaya, I'm actually installing Kesava on the forehead. Now, there are 12 principal manifestations, so there are actually 12 parts of the body that are being marked with tilak. And by doing so, we are basically yeah, turning the body into a temple. I have a temple on my forehead. Is it more like a reminder that your body is a temple? That is an external approach. See, okay. the external answer would be it's to remind that the body is a temple. A deeper answer is the body is actually become a temple because I've installed the deity. Wow. Mm. Um, please tell us about uh, the, the, the necklace you have. Tulsi is, of course, a great pure devotee of Krishna and very dear to Krishna. So whatever is offered to Krishna, any, any preparations that are cooked, always Tulsi leaf on top. Otherwise, Krishna will not accept. So wearing Tulsi wood, Krishna will naturally be inclined towards that person. So the mercy is there. So one is attracted. See, in this bag, which you have been looking at all this time, I actually have a Tusi Mala. Yeah. And if you look closely, you can see that it's quite shining, as you can tell. Yeah. Also. Yeah. That yeah. at the right hand. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. No problem. Yeah. But, you know, you can see. These are 108. 108. Yeah. And you can see they're shining. Yeah. But they were not shining when I got it. It is from all these years chanting on these beats. Many, many years, the same ones. Every day I've been chanting. But so you, you chant every day, whole day? Not the whole day, because I, I do many other things, like sitting in uh, television studios. <laughs> <laughs> or Lastly, I want to ask, uh, is there a reason why you shave the head? Um, monks are shaving their heads. And but you, you have a tail. But, yes. So in... In Hinduism, in, in the tradition, we find that uh, the little mark at the back actually is the sign of a Vaishnav, traditionally. So Vaishnav, either worshipping Ram, worshipping Vishnu, worshipping Krishna, they will keep the little Sika, right? They'll keep that Sika. The uh, Mayavad, who are basically saying that Everything is impersonal, there is no, no personal uh, God, there's only an all-pervading Brahman energy and nothing more. They will wear the three horizontal lines and they will not keep the, uh, the Sika at the back, okay. the shaved arrow. Thank you very much for sharing the symbolisms associated with this con. It helps me understand better uh, what I see. Yes, so symbolism is useful in life. Everyone creates some ritual or symbol in life. Right? We all are human beings who are inclined towards habits. Yes. And habits is a, is, a, is a means of ritualistic activity. So we are creating habits that nourish our spiritual life. So all the symbolism is actually supporting that, that ultimate goal in life, to always remember the Supreme Lord and to never forget Him. Wow. That's on such it. wise words, thank you very much for being uh, with us on this studio and it has been a pleasure in having this conversation with you. Well, likewise, you know, <laughs> oh, I am so happy to, uh, to have met you in the studio and I'm looking forward to meet you also sometimes outside of the studio. I found that earlier on you described to me how you were, uh, had a teacher who would tutor the students at home, and it would always be very personal and feed the students very nicely yeah. before they came. I like that story a lot, and I felt that in the same way today, 
it went beyond an interview, right? It was like, I feel I made a friend here today. We, so well, we are friends. I'm so nice. Thank you very that much. We, that we could meet. That was Thank really you very wonderful. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The reason why I told you this story is because that person changed my life. Yeah, I believe for, that. Forever. Yeah. Oh, he was an educator, Thank not a teacher. That's right. <laughs> a great blessing. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this episode of Encounter. We have an email address displaying at the bottom of your screen so for your suggestions and proposals. Thank you very much for being with us. Catch us again next time, next week on the same channel. <laughs>